I have always been fascinated by historical portraits, just anything taken during the 20th century, during the age of photography, the incredible historical figures that were alive during that time, and the history behind those photos, the, the portrait of Churchill with Karsh stole the cigar out of his mouth, the last known portraits of James Dean in Times Square. It's, uh, it's hard not to get slightly emotional and to feel something when you see those photos. And while we will never get those moments back, as a photographer, I'm also interested in the other side of those photos, the technical nature of how they were shot, the considerations that the photographer made, the gear that was used, just the how they created that look and that feeling during that time. And that small part is what I want to focus on in detail today. I want to take you with me as I explore the equipment they used, the challenges they would have faced, and ultimately, is there still a benefit to shooting in that way, given the conveniences of modern technology. Now the first challenge I faced before I even began was probably the most universal difficulty of any portrait photographer, which is I didn't have any friends who I could convince to take photos of. So today's discussion is going to go a step further from simply taking portraits to taking self-portraits using old technology. And trust me, spoiler alert, self-portraits are infinitely harder. And the first challenge that I faced is probably the first thing that most people learn in photography, and that is the composition. The benefit of a modern digital camera is that you can just snap away taking photos from every which way, every different angle until you get home. You can compare them all on the screen and you can choose the one that you like the best from the thousand photos you took of the same subject. Not that that's good practice, but you, you get my drift. Whereas with film, not only are you limited by the number of shots that you can take, but when you're taking self-portraits, it's extremely difficult to know how that composition looks. As much as any photographer loves layering subjects between foreground and background and trying to perfectly compose them between the two, when it comes to shooting self-portraits with film, you have too many things to worry about, your focus, your lighting, everything that we're gonna talk about later, that realistically, it's best to just try and keep things simple. The second thing I learned from my first shoot was that when I got on location, I really didn't have that many ideas of compositions that I could use. So for my second shoot, I decided to do my homework. I looked at a ton of reference imagery and I learned a whole lot about different framing and different ideas that I could implement for my next time around. In case you're interested in this for yourself, I found that first of all, Pinterest is a fantastic resource for photos, for portraits. As long as you find something that you like, it's so easy to then find other similar images that kind of look the same, have the same feeling, the same color palette even same similar compositions. Also, I started using Shot Deck recently. It's, it's frankly, it's amazing, not just for my videos, but also for photos. At the end of the day, we all want our photos to look like movies, or at least a lot of us do. And that's kind of one of my main inspirations for photography. And I find that the movie stills, because of the, the reality of a movie, the way that the people are moving within the scene, things are happening. You get some really natural, beautiful looking shots that kind of are taken in the moment versus a very staged photograph. And finally, of course, I've sort of built up a small collection over time of photography books, of portraits, of kind of famous historical photos. These are amazing reference. This photo here of Che, I actually didn't use as reference, but you'll see later, I kind of accidentally recreated this portrait almost exactly. So those are a couple of things that have helped me a lot since that first shoot that you just saw. Uh, just for reference, by the way, I've been shooting this video for about six weeks now, every weekend taking more self-portraits, developing the film, learning again, and uh, yeah, a lot of work went into this one, so stay tuned. So once I began to improve my composition, the second thing I wanted to focus on was lighting, and, and by extension of that, the color within the scene. First thing I thought was, can I get an old school flash to kind of match the camera and to actually be realistic with the lighting that perhaps would have been used back in the early 1900s? But to be honest with you, I got kind of lazy here because I've used old flashes in the past. 
I know their limitations and I have so much lighting already, it didn't really make sense for me to spend all the money on that, but you can get flashes if that's something you wanna try. Instead, I focused it on just using constant light. That also helped with me filming this video, so kind of just, you know, two birds of one stone. In this particular instance, I used my favorite portable light, which is the Aperture Amaran 60X, I think. One thing to note that I learned, if you are shooting portraits with film, it is beneficial to have a variable color balance light instead of like the 60D, just the daylight one, because depending on what film stock you're using, I found that the color balance definitely shifts quite drastically. When I use something like a 500T, I found that the tungsten white balance film does actually hold up surprisingly well to daylight if you're outdoors shooting. And I'm not entirely sure why that is, but I'm guessing it's something to do with all of the different spectrums of light that are available that's able to pick up. I, I don't understand this, like, the physics behind it. Don't, don't question me on that. Definitely don't quote me on it. This is when you're shooting indoors. I guess the lights are a very specific color temperature. I just found that shooting indoors, if you're using something like a tungsten color balanced film stock and you have daylight balanced lights, you get this super strong blue color cast. And if you're not careful, it, it really can ruin your photo. So in this instance, you'll see that I actually used a much warmer light. I switched to my, my aperture to 2700 Kelvin to match the tungsten film stock that I was using. And that was how I was able to get much more natural skin tones within this shot. So we've already touched on this a little bit, but I think when it comes to choosing film stock, the first thing I learned was that some film stocks are more flattering to skin tones than others, the more natural looking, more easy to deal with. For example, the Portra series of film stocks, I know they do seem to be overused, but I think it's for good reason, to be honest. I found that using Portra just gave me a nice flat image, made it a lot easier for me to edit after the fact. And if I kind of messed up the exposure just a little bit, it was much easier for me to pull it back. So whether you're kind of a beginner to film or you're super experienced, I still think that Portrait is a fantastic option for portraits. But to make my life even easier, I just started using black and white. If you wanna make your photos look like an old 1920s movie, then this is the way. Film stocks like the Cinestill VWXX, basically Eastman XX film, which is the film stock they used to use and still use in movies. But at the end of the day, as you'll see throughout this video, I found the best thing for me was just to buy a load of different film stocks try them out and just see which one I like best. Okay, so everything I've talked about so far is really relevant to, I would say, any kind of portrait photography, whether it's self-portraits or taking photos of someone else. But the next two things are really where that huge difference in difficulty lies. And the first challenge that I faced was trying to get proper focus. First of all, without watching where you're standing, it's extremely difficult to anticipate and guess exactly where you're gonna be in that frame. And if you're shooting with an old school medium format like I was, or even a large format, that plane of focus can be extremely thin. And to make things worse, the optical viewfinders on these old cameras, quite often the mirrors are faded or scratched and things really aren't that clear, even if you're looking through it yourself. It's very difficult sometimes to tell where your point of focus is, especially if the subject is dark. But to be honest, there's a very simple solution to this, probably obvious to most people, and that's just to have something to put in place of where you're gonna be. The only difficulty here is that you need to remember to take something with you, whether it be a spare tripod or a light stand, whatever it is that you can put as like a dummy from where you're gonna be sitting or standing so that then you can go back to your camera, you can set that perfect point of focus. As I said, it can be difficult even to do that if you're in a dark situation, if there's no much light in the scene. So I did find it really helpful to always have a torch or flashlight on me. Simply being able to place that like on the top of the tripod or whatever it is that I'm focusing on, or even just standing back and pointing it at it, just lighting it up. Simply introducing more light into that viewfinder can make your life a whole lot easier. I know it sounds kind of dumb, but trust me, definitely helps. And then sometimes if I'm ever in any doubt or I want to guarantee a sharper image, I just set the camera to a higher aperture. It increases the depth of that plane of focus and it sharpens the image at the same time. Now finally, this is the most difficult, some would say impossible part of taking self-portraits if you don't have the right gear. But the easiest part 
if you do. Basically, I'm telling you you need to buy something, which you should be happy to hear. Most of us like to know that we can just buy something and all of our problems go away. Essentially, there are exactly two types of release that I use besides simply pressing the shutter. First of all being the cable release. I would argue that a cable release is an essential tool for anyone who's shooting with film cameras, whether you're shooting portraits of someone else or self-portraits or even landscapes. I use these a lot for landscapes because you can set up your camera on a tripod, you can attach your cable release, and you can take a photo without having any kind of camera shape. And the second and definitely the coolest type of release that I use is one of these. And what this is, is a mechanical self timer. Essentially what you do is you set the timer by winding it up, you lock it into place, and then you screw this into your camera. And when you're ready to go, you just simply release the timer. So you do the same thing that you would do if you were shooting with like a digital camera timed. You would set your timer on your camera, you start the shot, and then you leg it to where you wanna be, get in position, and then you take the shot. If you wanna buy one of these yourself, there's tons of them on eBay. Just search for like self timer mechanical shutter or I think some, something like that you'll get a ton of results this one is an auto nips made in Germany from like the 1950s I think it's plenty of variations just make sure that it has the screw in end because you can get some proprietary runs or like Polaroid and things like that which may not fit all cameras if I had to choose between the two I think in situations where I can use the cable release I always will because it just has a bit more control I can hit the shutter when I need to so I'm not kind of like estimating when the timer is gonna close, kind of like anything, even though you know it's coming, uh, you kind of like find yourself trying to like not blink and you, you end up kind of looking like a deer in headlights versus uh, if you have one of these, you can kind of get comfortable, get in position and, and take the shot in your own time. But they're both pretty cheap, they're reliable, you buy it once and you'll have it forever. Going back now to the original point, of this video, what was the equipment that was used in the past? What are the challenges today? Is it still feasible? Is it still worth doing nowadays? At the end of the day, I think yes. You know, certain areas were certainly more difficult than I expected. Getting the, the right framing is so much harder than it is nowadays with modern technology. Just getting the focus, you know, I didn't expect the viewfinder to be a concern there. I thought I would have difficulties kind of getting the right plane, but physically seeing whether it's in focus was not something I anticipated to be a problem. I do think that, that taking portraits on film and, in, and certainly taking self-portraits is a very challenging task that does take quite a bit of patience, quite a bit of practice to kind of work out what works for you. It's definitely not something I believe you can just go into the first time and just take bangers. It definitely takes a bit of trial and error, but ultimately you're able to capture images that you otherwise would never be able to capture, in my opinion, with a modern camera. Yes, you can imitate nowadays, you can shoot on digital and you can add layers and grain and other things and change the colors and, and you can, to be honest, you can probably fool most people, but it, it comes down to who you are as a person and whether that that is enough for you. For me, it's not enough. I want to truly recreate the look of medium format film. And the only way to do that is to shoot with it. I want to go through these hardships. I want to face these experiences, these challenges, because at the end of the day, the final result is just that much sweeter.